so anyway, so going forward now, what I want to go over here today is first getting our fundamentals right in terms of what is the difference between the post-acquisition environment and the dissolution environment. In the dissolution environment, what do we do with the assets? When um, Cali bought Malibu, what did they do with the assets? In a way, they just transferred the assets right over to their balance sheet. And that was it. In the post-acquisition environment, we don't do that. When we acquire a company, we record investment into subsidiary. Investment into subsidiary. What, why do we do that? Because we, we own a subsidiary, but we decide to keep track of them as an investment. And this investment may go for years, but we decide to keep track as an investment. What is the balance, the first initial balance of that investment? The purchase price. Because the investment, in a way, the parent records it on their books because the parent owns an asset. You know, how is value assigned in accounting most of the time? So yeah, exactly, based on historical costs. So if you got something for a billion, there you go, boom, you put it on your balance sheet as a billion. So that's an investment into it. Now, the after acquisition environment, what happens in the after acquisition environment is we're faced with a certain task. We're faced with a certain task. One, number one objective is to keep track of the investment as an investment. Very important. We're trying to keep track of the investment as an investment. Now, me coming from the asset management world, I have a pretty clear view of why that is. Because oftentimes I notice the executive doesn't know the numbers so much, just knows the business. The accountant knows the numbers. So oftentimes the executive would ask me, listen, what's going on with that thing, with that investment? And I would be like, oh, well, we had a billion dollars, you know, we made some money this year, we lost some money, there was a dividend, you know, it's a billion dollars right now. Why does he need to know that it's a billion dollars? He may want to sell it. So basically, we're keeping track of the stored value of what we have via this account called investment. And it's important to know its balance for financial decision making. Now at year end, this is our objective, is to keep accurate track of this investment account. But at year end, we need to eliminate it. We need to eliminate it because at year end, we're going to get all the assets of the sub transferred to our balance sheet. No longer being an investment, but now being actual hard assets in the form of current assets, equipment, software. So the two objectives that we have is to keep track of the investment account as is, to know where our investment actually is. And the second part is to eliminate that account at your end as part of the gap requirement that you must consolidate. Consolidate means bringing the underlying subsidiary assets in their true form onto your own balance sheet. So we must eliminate the investment account. And what do we do next year? We forget that the elimination happened and we continue to keep track of the investment account as is. We do that because again, the CEO is gonna ask you, what, hey, hey, Greg, what's the investment account? Where are we at with that? You're gonna tell them because you're keeping track of it, right? At your end, you're gonna convert to commingling your assets. So this is the two tasks that we are dealing with now. One is keeping track of the investment account, and the other is eliminating it and then forgetting that elimination ever happened and continuing to keep track of the investment account. Now, what is the method that we're using to achieve this? The consolidation worksheet. You know, the, the consolidation worksheet puts a certain framework to this process just so there's some structure around what we're doing. And that's called the consolidation worksheet of methods of investment. Yeah, there is. There is. This is all post acquisition. Yeah. We're in the post acquisition environment, guys. And what are we saying? What is what is the 
sort of idea of equity method, partial equity method, or the initial value method. It's how you record your investment into subsidiary. The equity method is we already know. You, you know, you, you increase it by the earnings of investee, you reduce it by dividends, right? You, you reduce it by the excess amortization of uh, fair value over book value, and you reduce it by the deferral of unsold inventory that's allocated to you. That's the equity method as we know it. So that's fine. Again, I'm just talking about how to keep track of your investment in the subsidiary. Why? Because the CEO wants to know, what do we own? Like, how much do we have? Oh, okay. Well, I got to use one of these three to tell you, to let you know. The initial value method, guys, is say you purchase something for, you purchase a gas station for 50 million, you keep the investment in the gas station at 50 million, regardless of the equity and earnings in the ST, the dividends, or anything. So it's very simple, the initial value method. Simplicity, right? And we're sacrificing relevancy because now the gas station has like, been making a ton of money, but we haven't included that in our investment. So that's going to change the relevancy of the situation. Attractive, right? What's the partial equity method? We record the equity and earnings in investee as a plus, right? And we record the dividends as a minus. So we can do that. What we don't record is the amortization of patents and the deferrals of inventory. So we sort of keep things more simple. And what do we get? Relevancy. Relevancy. You know, I think that also, guys, in the world of accounting, a lot of times, I've seen a lot of processes where um, I worked a lot with like hot, large amounts of data, large amounts of data flow with big accounting systems. A lot of times the discussion was always um, in terms of getting a correct number or a better number. The executives would somebody say, you know what, that's just going to take too much work because the data, we have to parse it and we have to write a code and we have to organize it and then it's just, we can't do it. We, we might as well have lower quality data than have going crazy to get the correct data. So a lot of times you may sacrifice some relevancy for the sake of efficiency. And sometimes the threshold would be too much. Be like, oh, you know what? We can't, you know, we have to get these numbers right. I don't care if you buy a new software, a new system, you got to do it. So it depends on, anybody know what it depends on? Materiality. It depends how affected are your numbers. Is it just like you're trying to be cute and perfect? Or if you don't do it, you're materially away from what's real. So it depends, like, threshold. So I'm going to run through the entries real quick and then work on an example. So what is the purpose of consolidation entry A, guys? You know, what is the purpose of this entry? And in a way, looking closer at elimination entry A, we see that it essentially transfers the value stored in the investment account into specific assets on the balance sheet to the degree that the subsidiary assets have fair value that exceeds book value. Remember that when we combine parent and sub, we will capture the book value assets by simply combining the assets on the balance sheet. So what am I saying here? In a, in a way, imagine the parent and sub assets, one by one, sitting next to each other. What, I, what, what am I saying that the consolidation entry A only, at, only captures the excess over book value? Because in, in consolidation, I have these financials and I have these financials. So when I combine current assets, what is going to be right? If I just add a cross, what, am I, what number am I going to get? 1.4. Just by looking at both financials, which we do, by the way, in consolidation, we look at both financials. Just by adding a cross, I'm going to get 1.4. So consolidation entry A doesn't want to capture the book value of the subsidiary, does it? We don't need an entry, guys. 
we can just add. Consolidation entries is when addition of just merging of the financials doesn't work. It's something additional, an additional procedure to fix something that's going on. If you can just add, I don't need a consolidation entry here. I can get 1.4. Listen, Cali and Malibu, current assets is 1.4. I got it. What am I trying to capture with consolidation entry A? I'm trying to capture that extra 100. Just that extra 100. Because when I merge these two companies, balances, the fair value of the subsidiary's current assets is not reflected in either financial. It's something that I have to put in. So how much do I put in? I say this piece of consolidation entry A would be 100 because that's the excess of fair value over book value, right? Um, the excess of software is going to be 100. And the excess, what would be the total excess then? The total excess would be 200. So in a way, consolidation entry A will have this piece, boom, 200. If you go back and see here, consolidation entry A, the, the purpose. Looking closer at elimination entry, we see that it essentially transfers the value stored in the investment account into specific assets on the balance sheet. So am I not taking what I'm currently in my investment account that I need to eliminate for assets like current assets, software, and equipment, but only to the degree that it's over book value because the book value I'm capturing by just adding up across. There you go. So that's basically consolidation entry A. Um, if the fair value is below book value, then you bring in the negative number. You bring in the negative number, and same thing. It's basically, you, you put that in as, a, as the journal entry, just the other side of the investment. So after consolidation entry is performed, what do we have? Correct fair market value markup of the assets and goodwill recorded on the parent's balance sheet. Everything is now in. Investment and sub partially eliminated. Sort of, I wanted to go over a little bit of journal entry S now. Journal entry S. What is the purpose of journal entry S, the stock entry? The stock entry. In, in a way, I'm talking about when I initially invested into the subsidiary, my investment had two pieces in it. It had the book value of the subsidiary and anything that's over book value in the subsidiary. Both those amounts ended up in my investment account. As our goal is now to eliminate the investment account at year end, what I'm doing now is I need to eliminate the investment account by subtracting the book value of the subsidiary. And what do I mean by that? The idea is that when I bought the subsidiary, there was two pieces to it. There was the book value of subsidiary and whatever is over book value of the subsidiary. That's in my investment account. What did journal A eliminate? Just the excess of book value. Just the excess of book value. Think about it. When, if I want to eliminate the entire investment, and I'm, I'm back here, I want to eliminate the entire investment. Journal entry A just dealt with these differences between 500 and 400 and between 600 and 500. So I only eliminated 200 out of the investment account. How can I eliminate the rest of it? The rest of it has to be this number. It has to be the book value of the subsidiary's assets. Right? So I have to eliminate that. So when you guys see this elimination, when you start looking in the worksheet and you're like, oh, S, why are they showing S as 600? Because that was the book value of the subsidiary's assets at the time of acquisition. You get rid of them at the value, that, the, their book value original. And, and, you know, there's a certain perfection here. Why does it tie out? Because you also eliminate the stock of the subsidiary. And the stock of the subsidiary gets eliminated and it's equal to the same amount that was the book value of the purchase. Why? 
because the book value of the purchase equaled the equity of the subsidiary at the time of purchase. You purchased their assets minus liability, right? So now when you, when you look back at it, you're like, oh, that's the piece that was assets minus liability. That's the piece that equals to the sum of what three things on the subsidiary's financial statement? Retain earnings, common talk, and additional paid in capital. If you add those three, right, that will be the book value of the subsidiary. So this piece comes out out of the investment, boom, and it eliminates the equity. Another piece with the equity here. If I'm adding balances straight across, would I add in the both companies' equities? No, because the subsidiary equity doesn't exist in terms of the consolidation process because only the parent's equity exists now. The subsidiary's equity doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because we bought it out. If we bought it out, it doesn't exist. The parent's equity exists, and the parent's equity is its prior year equity plus current year income less current year dividends. No such thing as subsidiary equity in the consolidated shape. So you eliminate it, and look at kind of an interesting thing here is that this elimination equals the investment elimination. The parent's equity? The parent's equity is equal to prior year parent's equity plus current year parent income minus current year parent dividends. It doesn't have any regard for anything else. It doesn't know about anything else. It's just that formula. So when you add it up, that's, that's how it comes together. And if you notice here, all the parent numbers kind of carry over with no regard to the subsidiary equity piece. 